So hi, everyone, and welcome to the third edition of Innovadam uh, webinar on uh, the art of protocol writing in dermatology. So we will wait about a minute just to allow our attendees to join. So today we are uh, very happy as we have a big group of uh, uh, different attendees from different countries, so in Europe, Canada, and US. So thanks for joining, and um, we really hope that you will enjoy this presentation. So I see that we have now uh, already many attendees connected. So um, I will first start by introducing myself. So my name is uh, Audrey Fortier, and I'm the manager of the Scientific Affair Group at Innovator Research, and I will be your host for today. Uh, I have over uh, 10 years of experience in the CRO environment, but more specifically in the cl clinical pharmacology, medical writing, project management, and scientific affair. So let's start with uh, the uh, agenda for today. So first, uh, we will start uh, by providing um, insight from the principal investigator perspective during uh, the protocol uh, development. We will continue by discussing key elements for the development of a high quality, scientifically sound and practically feasible um, protocol in dermatology. We will also provide a protocol consideration in key therapeutic areas such as atopic dermatitis, psoriasis and acne vulgaris. Uh, please note that we have a Q&A session at the end, so please not hesitate to send in your question or any comments uh, at any time during the webinar. And uh, you can use it uh, with the Q&A panel in the menu. And if time permits, we will uh, answer the question at the end. So the success of any clinical study uh, starts with a good study protocols. And the overall quality greatly depends on this document. Um, this is especially true for multi-center studies, uh, which involve many investigator and clinical staff. So with no further delay, Dr. Bissanet will start this presentation by sharing the principal investigator perspective uh, during protocol development. So uh, board certified in dermatology, Dr. Bissanet is the president and founder of Innovaderm Research. And CRO specializing in the design, uh, conduct, and analysis of clinical trial in, pharma, in um, dermatology. He has published over 200 publications and book chapter, and he uh, gives lecture in, um, in different topics of dermatology at national and international uh, meetings. So I will now pass it on to Dr. Bissonnette. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, maybe. Um, I don't have many slides. Uh, I, I thought that I would um, introduce maybe this session by giving you the investigator's um, opinion on what is a good protocol. So what's good from an investigator's perspective? So as an investigator, uh, I want protocols to be clear. Uh, I want to know who is eligible, who is not eligible. Uh, too many times I've worked with protocols where the inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria are very lengthy with many and or and or so that you read it. And at the end, uh, I'm not really sure who's eligible or not. And my interpretation is different from my coordinator, which is different from the CRA, which is different from the sponsor. So I, I really dislike when I get this type of, uh, of wording in a protocol. Uh, I want to know exactly from a severity perspective, disease perspective, um, prohibited medication perspective, what patient, what type of patient I can put into the study. Uh, Co-medication is very important, specifically in dermatology. I would say it's probably more important in dermatology than other areas of medicine because our patients are using many topical products. Um, they're also using many topical products that are not drugs, but that have high efficacy um, or sometimes can have a detrimental effect on skin diseases. I'm referring specifically to patients using various types of products on their skin, on their face in an acne study. 
moisturizer creams can be extremely effective for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. So I want it to be very clear, what do I need to do with all those products that my patients are using on their skin? I also know, want to know, what do I need to do? This might be very simple, but investigators, unfortunately, rarely read the entire study reference manuals so that um, if there's something really important for investigators to know, it has to be in the protocol. What is to be done with the skin biopsies or the blood draws, that's fine for the study reference manual. But if, if something is key from an investigator perspective and it's hidden in the study reference manual, that is a problem. I like protocols that are simple and obviously recruitable. Simple meaning not too many physicians evaluations. Two, three is good, 10, 12 is probably too much. Uh, what we have seen is if you put too many evaluations in the same protocol, the quality tends to go down. So often physicians would devote a certain amount of time to see a patient in a research setting or perspective. Uh, and if the number of evaluations requires two, three or four times that amount of time, then they tend to work a little faster and the quality tends to go down. Uh, I want to know from a very clear in a protocol what is required from the investigator and what I can delegate to a non-medical person. Obviously, I want uh, the protocol to be safe and I want the safety evaluations that are in line with the safety profile of the drug in the protocol. Uh, I recently started to work in a study where uh, it was an early phase study with a systemic medication and there was no physical exam at the screening visit. Uh, I don't think this is safe. Uh, I, I decided to do a physical exam, but now I'm deviating from the protocol, but this is you know, medical practice. So we want to make sure that from a blood work perspective, uh, the blood work is sufficiently uh, frequent to ensure patient safety, and we're really testing what we need to know or exclude for the patient to be safe. Finally, patient-friendly, and this goes with recruitable, uh, investigators don't like protocols that are looking for a very small portion of the patient population because the inclusion exclusion criteria are just too narrow and requiring too much from patients. So patients want to be present at the research site. They want to get better. They want to have research, but they want to spend as uh, um, less time as possible at the clinical research unit. So reasonable number of questionnaires and daily evaluations. Um, I've seen protocols with 10 or 15 questionnaires. Again, we have issues in terms of quality because patients tend to rush. Daily evaluations of provitis are okay, uh, but if you ask for provitis and pain and two, three, four, five questionnaires with 10 uh, or 20 different questions, then again, we tend to lose patients and patients tend to not complete their questionnaires. Avoid non-necessary lengthy visit. Try to write the protocol in such a way that uh, things are done fast at the research center. And if possible, uh, provide patients access to active treatment. This makes a huge difference for physicians. It makes a huge difference when I propose a study to my patients if at the end of the four, eight, 12, or 16 weeks of placebo controlled uh, period, they can have access to active medication. So that was my investigator's perspective. Now uh, I'll turn the, the uh, mic again to Audrey Fortier who will continue uh, telling us um, how to write a great protocol. Thank you, Dr. Bissonnet, for providing these important points on the uh, investigator perspective. So we'll now mo move on to our next topics, uh, which is what are the uh, key elements to consider for uh, writing high quality protocols in dermatology. So why first is it so important to write a protocol, uh, a high quality protocol from the start? So in the, initial, in the start of phase of the study, uh, the main focus is often on timelines, which put a lot of pressure on the finalizing uh, the protocol quickly. But while finalizing the protocol is an important step, uh, making sure it meets high quality standards is uh, essential because poorly written uh, protocols um, may result in an increased number of uh, protocol amendments and consequently have great impacts on timelines and costs. And it can also delay the approval by regulatory agencies and ethics committees due to question or changes required during the review process. Uh, it can also increase the number of uh, protocol deviation and have an impact on data quality. 
And finally, poorly written protocol may um, make uh, have a, a increase uh, in the level of a study complexity by having uh, unnecessary uh, collection of data or a, a high number of study procedures and ultimately causes the site disengagement. So while in the opposite, the high quality protocol have uh, the, uh, the completely opposite effects, so have uh, results in a reduced number of uh, preventable amendment, increase in data quality, cite uh, interest in the study, and ultimately have a positive impact in enrollment rate and overall study success. Um, so the, the impact of protocol amendments in the, is uh, well described in the literature. Um, findings uh, from Getz et al. showed that 57% of protocol had at least one substantial amendment with an average of 2.3 amend amendments in the phase two, phase three studies. And amongst these amendments, half were deemed uh, um, to be preventable amendments. Another interesting fact is that protocol with at least one protocol substantial amendment had a reduced enrollment rate relative to the original plan compared with the protocols with no amendments. So this highlights a, a real impact on recruitment. Finally, the cost uh, to implement substantial amendment is quite significant based on this analysis. So considering all these facts, a uh, high quality standard uh, should be reached during the protocol development to avoid the burden of uh, and delays caused by protocol amendments. So one of the first steps before initiating the protocol uh, is to ensure that the team in charge of this task has the adequate um, experience and knowledge of the therapeutic area of uh, interest. So working with clinical scientists for the protocol development offers many advantages over a mid provider. Uh, clinical scientists typically have a various experience in clinical research, which is a great asset uh, in designing the study protocol. And they have in-depth knowledge of the therapeutic area of interest. In addition, uh, throughout the course of the study, the clinical scientist is involved in key step um, of the study and in the preparation of various documents, uh, such as the study design, uh, synopsis, up to the writing of the clinical study report and uh, publications. The clinical scientists also provide a scientific expertise, uh, expertise throughout the conduct of a study to the operational team, uh, which lead to an in-depth understanding of the many challenges that can occur during a study for uh, consideration in future protocols. So this added to the medical and the scientific uh, uh, writing experience, the uh, rigor and attention to detail, the clinical scientist is uh, well indicated for this uh, role. So at Innovaderm, uh, we have uh, our team in charge of the protocol writing um, has a great um, our clinical scientist and uh, they have a great experience in uh, the dermatology field. And you will uh, meet with uh, three of them uh, later today in the presentation. So it is also important to have a clear process for the development and the review of a protocol uh, with the goal to um, prepare a comprehensive document that will clearly describe the, um, the purpose of the study. So in order to achieve this, the clinical scientists can rely on uh, many experts throughout the process including the project manager, data manager, um, the uh, biostatistician, uh, representative from the uh, clinical site and regulatory affair. Uh, so the participation of uh, an internal multidisciplinary uh, team from the CRO that will be involved at each step of the study ensure an efficient review uh, and that all the, uh, the key element of a study is adequately described in the protocol. Uh, in addition, an important uh, uh, role of the clinical scientists is to build excellent relationship with KOL um, uh, that are expert in their, in their uh, uh, therapeutic area. Um, this is uh, important uh, in order to ensure um, a credible and a robust protocol. A collaborative approach involving all the different team results uh, uh, in a reduced risk of uh, errors and uh, needs for future protocol amendments. 
This also allowed to identify risk early in the process and to uh, plan for a mitigation, mitigation measure um, accordingly. So all of these considerations strengthened the decision to work with the CRO internal team starting at the writing uh, stage of the protocol. Another important aspect to consider during the protocol is the review by a clinical site. So protocol uh, review by site coordinator and investigator um, provides a great insight from an execution perspective. So working closely with all the individuals that, that are in direct contact with the patient um, allow to uh, have an optimized protocol to consider the patient perspective and also to increase the site engagement toward the study. So at Innovaderm, our clinical research unit is involved in the review of all uh, our protocols and their cont contribution has great uh, value to the document. So how to assess the writing capabilities of, of your CRO prior to selecting it for this role? Uh, so in addition to, as mentioned uh, earlier, to um, uh, look into the experience and knowledge in the uh, therapeutic area, and also having an established process to review the protocol, validating that there are tools in place to support the medical, the clinical scientists in the writing of the protocol is uh, imperative. So the use of the, a protocol template is quite common in the industry, uh, but having a, a protocol template that is adapted to the area of expertise is, uh, is essential. Um, built upon many years of experience with various indications in dermatology, uh, we have developed at Innovaderm a protocol template that contains a, a, a protocol a consideration for a different indication in a dermatology. And also include the instruction that is based from the lessons learned from uh, many previous studies we've run in these indications. Um, it also contains a large library of efficacy and the PRO uh, description, which is aligned with the current uh, literature. So a protocol template um, is, uh, provides a common structure, basically uh, organized that facilitate the review process by all the internal team and help to streamline uh, the process for improved timelines. Uh, finally, another very important point is to have protocol checklists to uh, verify that all the essential doc, uh, information is present in the protocol. So at Innovaderm, we have developed disease-specific checklists that allow us to uh, uh, gain in efficacy, efficiency during the preparation of the protocol to ensure that all the uh, right elements for each indication are uh, included in the protocol. And this to uh, help reducing the risk of error and needs for future protocol amendments. So overall, all these key uh, elements uh, uh, can have a significant impact on the overall quality of the protocol and are to be considered during the initiation of, a pro of, a, of your project. So I will now pass it on to my colleague, uh, Stéphanie Ligaré, who will introduce key protocol consideration in atopic dermatitis. Thank you, Audrey. So before we review important elements to consider when writing protocols in atopic dermatitis, I'd like to first introduce myself. I'm Stéphanie Ligaré, and I'm a clinical scientist at Innovator. I'm a molecular biologist by trade, and I have more than 10 years combined experience in translational and clinical research. So the first of the three indications that we will cover in today's uh, webinar is atopic dermatitis, or AD. Um, Audrey, can we go to the next slide, please? So atopic dermatitis is the most common chronic inflammatory skin disease. Its prevalence range is between 2 to 5% in adults and 2 to 20% in children. AD is a multifactorial condition that is characterized by localized or disseminated lesions, usually accompanied with itching, and current therapeutic options achieve sign and symptom control rather than cure, explaining why there's a strong medical need to identify new treatment alternatives for the disease. So before approaching the writing of a protocol in atopic dermatitis, and this also applies to any dermatological condition, 
It's important to examine the competitive landscape for the indication under study, and also to understand at which stage the study drug is in its clinical development. Can we go to the next slide, Andre? Thank you. So uh, the drug is, is the drug in, is being studied in phase one, phase two, phase three, was it approved? In phase one studies, we often aim to evaluate the safety and pharmacokinetics of the study drugs. So we should uh, include more inten intensive lab tests, ECGs, and vital sign assessments to provide a more comprehensive assessment of the drug safety profile. Uh, it's also possible to examine uh, efficacy in, early, in small early phase uh, studies, and this can be done uh, by looking at biomarkers. For a group of concept trials and phase two studies, it's important to select the most uh, the, the primary uh, efficacy endpoint that is the most likely to show a difference or will have the greatest power to show a difference between treatment groups and therefore allow advancement of the study drug into later phase studies. And for phase three trials, uh, which are designed as pivotal trials, the protocol should be aligned as much as possible with the requirements of regulatory agencies. So this requires a more thorough review of the literature, also to consult the most recently published guidance and to discuss with regulatory authorities. So once we know in which study phase the drug is being investigated, the next step is to uh, design the study. So depicted on screen here is the general approach used for AD trials involving topical or systemic agents. And you'll see in the next uh, section that it's very similar in psoriasis and acne. Uh, in both cases, for topical and systemic uh, in studies involving topical and systemic agents, we recommend a screening period of 30 days. And the reason for this is to allow subjects who are using medications that need to be stopped at least four weeks or 28 days prior to baseline to wash out from these medications within the screening period. The next step is randomization. And in AD trials, randomization can be at the level of level of subjects or within subjects, depending on whether the investigational agent is topical or systemic. And there are multiple advantages to the use of an intra-individual design, including a reduction in inter-subject variability. And can we go to the next slide? Perfect. So I was just mentioning another study to which Innovator participated in which 40 adult subjects had two lesions of identical severity randomly assigned to treatment with crisoperol or vehicle applied twice daily for two weeks. In the study, there were biopsies that were collected at different time points and also clinical evaluations that were performed, uh, including the lesion pruritus and RS. And the results were actually very interesting in the study. They demonstrated that uh, the, there was a significant improvement in lesion pruritus and RS very early on in, in treatment demonstrating that subjects can effectively differentiate the intensity of itch at two different locations on their body. So if the intent is to have an early read as to whether a treatment has efficacy at improving itch, then the intrapatient uh, design can be an interesting option. So there are many advantages to the use of an intra-individual design, but it's also important to keep in mind there, that there are several challenges and limitations. Uh, and that those should be addressed in the protocol. For example, the administration in most cases should be on site and the disease severity for eligibility should not be too severe because there's only two lesions being treated. Now, uh, going back to our study diagram, design diagram, another key element that needs to be defined uh, before writing your protocol is obviously is dosage and duration of treatment. In AD trials, we recommend a treatment period of four to eight weeks. This is relatively short, but uh, atopic dermatitis is a highly symptomatic disease, so the study drug should demonstrate efficacy relatively quickly in order to be viable commercially. And it's also been suggested in, in studies that uh, efficacy, there's a greater difference in efficacy between the active and control groups uh, between four and eight weeks of treatment. Actually, the phase 2b uh, study, to which Innovaderm also participated in the next slide, there was a greater difference in the change from baseline and easy between the active and placebo groups in at weeks uh, four, six, and eight, as shown by the blue box, compared to week 12, shown by the orange box. And similar findings were also observed in a larger phase 2B uh, study involving top in a row for the treatment of AD. 
So this explains why we recommend a treatment period of four to eight weeks in our study. So once the study has been designed, the next step is to describe the desired study population with eligibility criteria. Uh, first, we should look at the disease severity. It should be clearly defined uh, using a BSA, EC, IG, and TLSS for eligibility and uh, applicable. It's also important that those are consistent with one another and the proposed ranges for disease severity on their study. Is it mild, moderate, or severe atopic dermatitis? In addition, uh, since, since AD is a highly fluctuating condition, it's important that these criteria are both at screening and baseline. Then the use of emollients, except that those containing urea, uh, should be allowed in AD trials. We prohibit the use of emollients containing urea simply because they've shown efficacy in the treatment of AD. The use of emollients, as I mentioned, should be allowed, but the application frequency should be controlled. We can establish a frequency and a protocol, once daily or twice daily, but this can also lead to multiple uh, protocol deviations. So instead, we recommend to write our protocols that in such a way that it provides flexibility. So instead, we can state that emollients should be used for a certain period of time prior to day one and at the same frequency during the study. It's also critical to prohibit the use of certain medications and procedures in AD trials. For example, certain antihistamines known to cause somnolence should be prohibited. And finally, since AD can be influenced by a number of external factors, uh, there's a number of lifestyle restrictions that should be put in place, especially for topical agents. Uh, it's important to think about the timing of exercise to avoid excessive sweating and the timing of bathing and swimming as these may impact treatment absorption and ultimately treatment efficacy. The next key elements to cover in a protocol, obviously, are the clinical assessments and endpoints. Clinical evaluations may include global AD severity assessments, such as the BSA, EZ, and IGA, or AD lesion severity evaluations when the study has an intra-individual design. Uh, if the drug is intended to be marketed in Europe, uh, the score ad should be evaluated. And it's also important to follow FDA guidance on the use of the VIG of zero or one, and at least a two point decrease from baseline for trials supporting new drug applications. In all phases of development, we also uh, advise to evaluate quality of life, as well as patient's perspective of efficacy using validated instruments. And one of the most frequently used scale, scale in AD trial is the Proritis NRS. And based on our experience, there's actually a number of key elements to consider with this type of scale. First, uh, what is the recall period? Are we looking at the past 24 hours or the previous week? What is the severity, the worst level of itch, or the average itch, and the frequency of evaluation? Itch and RS scores should begin to be captured several days prior to baseline, and uh, it should be evaluated itch, uh, on a daily basis, but the weekly average should be the final output. It's also possible to plan uh, numerous pharmacodynamics assessments, such as stage stripping, biopsy collection, and transepidermal water loss in uh, AD studies. But we should always keep in mind the burden that these may represent to patients. Ultimately, the study endpoints are determined based on the study phase, the study design, and the planned study evaluations. So together, this summarizes the process we go through to write our protocols in the topic dermatitis. Along the process, we also make recommendations that are driven by the literature as well as internal initiatives. In a meta-analysis that was recently published, we demonstrated that continuous instruments, such as the EZ, BSA, and IGA, that are used in topical clinical trials of 480, had a significantly higher sensitivity compared to dichotomous endpoints. So we recommend uh, uh, continuous efficacy measures as they provide more power for proof of concept trials with small sample size and AD with topical therapies. In the end, scientific evidence coming from internal initiatives such as this one help us write high quality protocols that may positively impact the clinical development of a study drug. So on this, I'll now pass it on to my colleague, Luz Vilsink, who will introduce key protocol considerations and psoriasis. Thank you, Stephanie. And good day, everyone. Um, in the following slides, I will give you some advices to write a good protocol on psoriasis. But I just want to uh, start with a bit of information about myself. 
So I'm a molecular biologist by trade, and I have almost 20 years of experience in clinical and translational research. <clears throat> um, before jumping into protocol considerations, I would like to give you a short overview on paxorises. So as you may know, paxorises is a chronic relapsing inflammatory skin disease, and it has a high prevalence worldwide of 1 to 2 percent. Uh, the incidence of psoriasis is bimodal, and this means that their peaks are tw uh, 15, 20 years old and 55, 60 years old. So as AD, this is a multifactorial pathology, and it's also often associated with uh, several comorbidities, such as uh, psoriatic arthritis that is observed in 30% of cases, or uh, obesity, for example. Um, so plaque psoriasis is characterized by thickened, scaling, and inflamed plaques, and it's associated with pruritus. And currently, the treatments will help to manage those signs and symptoms, but there is no cure. So when designing a clinical study on plaque psoriasis, the specific features of this pathology need to be taken into consideration. As opposed to AD, uh, plexorizes is a very stable condition. Therefore, it's possible to conduct proof of concept studies with a small number of subjects, a uh, few uh, study centers, and it's also possible to include subjects with a small BS involved. In addition, it's important to realize that the intense erythema that is associated with the skin lesions can take many months to fade. And for this reason, a longer treatment duration in comparison with AD um, should be uh, considered. So we suggest a 16 week treatment duration and a primary endpoint evaluated at week 16. So uh, this is for proof of concept studies, and especially when uh, we evaluate a new mechanism of action. For phase two, three studies, uh, we recommend a 12 to 16 week treatment duration. But this longer treatment duration should not only be uh, considering when designing a clinical study, but it's also uh, important to have it uh, considered upstream during the toxicology evaluation. We often have uh, toxicology assessed on a too short time period, so uh, it's important to have at least uh, 16 weeks. Um, so the next step uh, in protocol writing is to determine the population. So in terms of disease characteristic and severity, eligibility is based on medical history, uh, severity of the disease, and uh, definition of severity using uh, clinical assessments such as the ASI, the PGA, BSA. And uh, you will see when determining the exclusion criteria that um, the focus is placed on comorbidities. Active uh, skin diseases, such as predominantly pustular uh, psoriasis, should be excluded. But it's critical not to be too stringent in criteria related to commonly associated comorbidities. We want to include a population uh, that is representative and we want to avoid hindering uh, subject enrollment. So as an example, considering obesity is a common comorbidity, uh, criterion BMI should not be too restricted. Um, so permitted and prohibited therapies should also be appropriately defined. Uh, emollients, uh, bath, shower, they have a limited impact on psoriasis. So the use of emollient, for example, should be allowed. Um, also considering uh, the scalp is one of the most, uh, the main body area uh, affected uh, by psoriasis. Um, we suggest in uh, studies with topical drugs uh, in which the scalp will not be treated to allow medicated shampoos. Um, in terms of uh, study restrictions, uh, the sun has a huge impact on psoriasis. So subjects who plan a trip to sunny areas during the study should be excluded. In terms of study assessments and endpoints, 
depending on the phase on the study treatment, the primary efficacy endpoints can be based on uh, TLSS or uh, early phase study on uh, topical treatments or on P, uh, PGA, passing BSA. And in studies, including subject with low BSA affected, um, the PASI is not sensitive enough. So we suggest a PGA or a PGA time BSA for the primary endpoint. The study may also uh, include evaluation of pruritus and of quality of life. So for quality of life, we suggest to use validated QL measures um, in all phases of development. And there are numerous uh, QL tools that can have advantages depending on the sponsor needs. But what we see is that uh, usually in studies, the QLQI is uh, included. But it is to be noticed that the QLQI uh, does not meet FDA requirements and cannot be used for claims. Um, whereas the PSSD, uh, which evaluates uh, psoriasis signs and symptoms, is a validated tool, it's accepted by the FDA, and it can be used in claims. Now, I would like to also provide a few suggestions related to palmoplantar fusulosis protocols. So PPP is the most common form of uh, fusular psoriasis, and it typically manifests at 40, 50 years old. It's also strongly associated with a uh, smoking history. So uh, this condition is persistent, it's painful, and it's, uh, often, uh, it often results in significant uh, impairment, uh, more functional impairment, and uh, impact on quality of life. Um, several uh, genetic studies uh, were conducted recently, and uh, they were conducted to understand the specific genetic risk uh, factors responsible for the locally restricted palmoplantar manifestation. And they suggested that this pathology may not be a pustular uh, variant of psoriasis, but a distinct disease entity. So uh, you can go to the next slide, thank you. So as mentioned, uh, the re uh, results from several genetic studies show that PPP uh, differentiated from psoriasis. So for example, in one of our recent study, we have observed increases in uh, both IL-36 receptor antagonist and IL-36 gamma expression. So, and this was observed in PPP lesions compared to normal skin. And these data, uh, combined with the lack of efficacy of uh, stekinumab and infliximab in PPP, indicate that the disease may be, uh, a, a, as I mentioned, a different entity and have a different pathobiology underlying the clinical onset of this uh, disease. So as you can see, uh, our recommendation on PPP are not only driven by the literature, but also by uh, internal initiatives, helping us to better understand this indication. And uh, this understanding has a positive impact on many aspects of the protocol. So when determining the population to include in PPP study, the disease characteristic and severity must be appropriately defined. Uh, and in comparison with psoriasis, PPP is not very stable. So uh, we don't suggest to include a criterion on disease stability before day one, for example. Uh, the diagnosis of this condition is also difficult and an, an appropriate definition of active postal should be used. We want them to be white, yellow, not brown. Um, in PPP study, other uh, active skin diseases uh, should be excluded, but why in plaque psoriasis, uh, we don't recommend to assess PPP in PPP studies, uh, exploratory efficacy and points uh, on plaque psoriasis can be included. So we recommend not to exclude uh, so plaque psoriasis from those studies. Uh, regarding clinical assessments, uh, studies usually include uh, clinical, clinician re reported outcomes such as uh, PPPASI, PPPGA. And note that in phase two, studies on uh, PPP, we recommend a primary efficacy endpoint based on the PPP. For phase three studies, considering only a few treatments are in the space of development, the primary endpoint should be confirmed with the FD. For patient reported outcomes, pruritus and pain. 
should be evaluated. And for QL, uh, we recommend to evaluate at least the DLQI. But as opposed to psoriasis, and consider, uh, considering the PPP can have a very high impact on daily life and work activities, we can include questionnaires such as the SF36, uh, the EQ5D, for example. Those can, have, uh, uh, can provide useful information. In conclusion, Writing a high quality level protocol on PPP implies to understand this very specific pathology and appropriately identify its specific features. And I will now pass it on to Anna Palian, who will introduce key protocol considerations on acne of guts. Thank you, Lucille. Uh, I'm Anna Palian, the scientific advisor here at Innova Germ, and I'll be presenting now the last education of today's webinar. I'm very excited to talk to you today about active vulgaris because for me, this is the best example in protocol writing where many exploratory endpoints may be included. And I'll share with you special consideration to take into account when writing a protocol with complex uh, sample collection and measurements. But before diving in, just a little bit about me. I'm a molecular biologist with over 20 years experience in translational and clinical research, including biomarker research. So a few quick lines about acne vulgaris. So it's defined as a chronic inflammation disease of the pilosubitious unit. And it's one of the most common skin diseases. When looking at the pathophysiology of the disease, acne vulgaris has three main culprits. It's increased sebum secretion, abnormal follicular currentization, and increased inflammation due to changes in the cutaneous bio, uh, microbiome. One of the challenges when conducting acne studies is the diversity of lesions types, uh, and also the, the requirement of manual counts of the lesions to assess the disease severity. As a reminder, we have non-inflammatory lesions, which are the open and closed comedons, and we have the inflammatory lesions. These are the papules, pustules, nodules, and cysts. Uh, acne lesions, are very common in areas where the pilosubitious glands are large and abundant. And this is the face, chest, neck, and back. And because of such localized lesions, we have interesting option study design randomizations. For topical treatments, we have the split face. Uh, this is an intra-patient randomization where half of the face is treated with a vehicle and the other half of the study drug. I'm not going into details today of the why and when we use such randomization, but I wanted to highlight this because when using this or when treating a small area with a steady drug, we have to think about special uh, consideration in the protocol when writing a limitation on the type and the quantity of assessment that can be included in the protocol. Now, looking at the eligibility criteria, for disease severity, we have IgA and lesion counts. When writing our criteria for lesion counts, we always have to include the type, the range, and the area. For example, facial acne vulgaris with 20 to 50 inflammatory lesions at day one. Something to keep in mind is when dealing with a split face, we, have, we want to add a line where we would explain that we want some symmetry between the two sides. For example, we want to avoid a situation where a subject has more than double lesions on one side versus the other. Uh, and also, as Lucille just explained a few minutes ago, when determining subject characteristics and our inclusion exclusion criteria, we always have to think about the education and the subject. In the case of acne trials, we will notice a focus place on hormone stability. So for this, we want to precise age group, sex, gender, hormonal treatment, and so forth. All criteria that will provide a study population with a somewhat homogeneous hormonal background noise. Um, however, this is something, uh, it's critical not to be too stringent when uh, determining these criteria because it might hinder patient subject enrollment. So in other words, this is where as a scientist, uh, we have to make this balance, this decision of what is the steady needs for data quality and what is the steady feasibility with desired enrollment timelines. An example of this is excluding females, uh, female subjects uh, with hormonal contraceptives. Because the majority of acne trials are done in young adults, 
uh, having such an extreme exclusion criteria will negatively impact subject enrollment and by such study timelines. So this is where we really have to keep the balance. Uh, and lifestyle restrictions are also a little bit different in ACLE studies, even more so because the severity assessments are performed on the face. So we have to think of, do we, would, do we want to allow subject to wear makeup? If the answer is no, well, what is the impact on enrollment? If we do, is there something that we should include or detail in protocol uh, that will not affect either the severity assessments or the data quality? Example, we can allow makeup, but make it as non-chromodigenic acne makeup. Or also uh, on the study day visit, not to apply the makeup ahead of the visit and so forth. Uh, other things to think about is the mechanism of action of the study drug. Um, example of this is, um, does, this, uh, does, it, does the study drug uh, affect sebum secretion? And is this something that is measured in a protocol? If the answer is yes, we have to think of the elements that can affect sebum secretion. Something that many people forget to include as an exclusion criteria is irregular sleep patterns. Many studies have shown, including this one that was performed here at New London Research, uh, demonstrated a link between irregular sleep patterns and uh, altered sebum secretion. Therefore, when we write a protocol, it's not only important to know uh, the indication that we're looking into the that, that's being studied in the trial, but also what we're measuring and being up to date with the literature, because it's such details that will allow the completion of a study with strong data quality. Um, now for end, I just want to make sure, sorry, no, for the end points, uh, because I'm looking at the time, I'm going to skim through this. I just want to highlight that we always refer to the FDA guidance to see what is required and how we can align this with the needs of the sponsor. And now I really want to focus on one of the reasons why I love writing early phase active protocols. And this is all the fun stuff that we can include as exploratory endpoints. Uh, an early phase study is the perfect occasion to let, collect samples and skin parameters to allow a better understanding of the study drug uh, mechanism, mechanism of action, and also the changes in signaling pathway. We have biopsies with which we can assess the suspicious morphology or even do slices for drug penetration, uh, even collect the content of sebaceous glands to perform lipidomics. We can measure the sebum uh, levels and excretion right on the skin surface to see how the steady drug affects sebum secretion. And also something that's really interesting is microbiome collection. This is something that's very interesting in acne trials. Recent studies have shown how changes in the microbiota are indicative of the inflammation that we observe in acne or vulgaris. Um, so when we think of all of these fun things that we can add to a protocol, we always have to think about feasibility. Does the patient have sufficient treated surface area to collect all these samples? Example, if we do a split phase, it will be really challenged to get the casual levels, sebum secretion levels, uh, rates, and also collect swabs of microbiome in a small area that's treated. Uh, another thing you have to think about is the subject experience in the study. Uh, if a baseline study is over six hours long because of all these extra measurements, assessments that we're doing, it won't be really enticing for the subject to participate in the study. And we also have to think about the site, how complicated it is to perform all these uh, special procedures and assessments. Do we need special equipment? Do we need special conditions to perform these uh, procedures? I know that these are all very operational questions, but when we write a quality protocol, we do think about these things. Now, uh, looking back at all the information that we have shared with you today, uh, there is one critical element that was really highlighted when writing high quality protocols, and that is a strong collaborative process. As you have seen, writing a good protocol is not only writing with proper grammar, nice page layout, listing all the prohibited meds with the proper washouts. And the art of writing a quality protocol is multifaceted. We want to have a correct study design that will maximize study success. 
point. I have an excellent collaborative efforts with a sponsor to capture all their needs and to streamline the writing process. I uh, want to be at the forefront of research and knowledge in dermatology and its multiple indications that will ensure subject safety and data quality. Additionally, here at InnovaDerm, we have our own renowned clinical research unit and we work closely together. Again, for collaborative processes, when we write protocols, we always work with them, with, their, with our clinical unit, to ensure that the subject experience and the study, the, what we're describing the protocol, is an enjoyable one. And we also want to make sure that our procedures and assessments are feasible for our clinic staff. In other words, a high quality protocol is not only scientifically sound, but operationally sound. And this has an immense effect on the success of study conduct. And more importantly, ensures site engagement and subject engagement throughout the trial. So that's it for me. Uh, please keep your questions coming and I'll pass the mic back to Audrey. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And thank you for all the speaker. Um, <clears throat> so, There we go. <laughs> so just to conclude, the, the protocol is really a central element in a clinical trial. And today we've shared with you a few aspects to take into consideration before writing this important document. So working with the server specialized in dermatology and with its multidisciplinary team, starting at the protocol stage offers really many, many advantages and we are, uh, um, we'd be happy to work with you on your next protocol. Uh, so on behalf of the speaker and Innoverderm, I'd like to thank you all for attending. And uh, before moving to the Q&A uh, session, just a little announcement uh, that uh, you can register to our next event at the uh, AAD on skin barrier dysfunction in dermatology. So you can scan the uh, QR code uh, to register now. So we do have received uh, already a few questions. So I will uh, will start um, looking into it. So, uh, so first question is related to the emollient use uh, in atopic dermatitis. So a question for my colleague Stephanie. <laughs> So you indicated uh, that subjects should continue use emollient uh, during the study. So do you have any specific recommendation uh, for the use of emollient uh, when the investigational product is a topical product uh, versus a systemic product? Yes, so that's a very good question. Uh, we do have recommendations for trials involving a topical versus a systemic agent. I did mention that uh, emollient should be allowed in AD trials, except those containing urea, so that's an important point. For studies involving a topical agent, um, emollients can be applied on the entire body, including AD lesions during the screening and follow-up period. However, during the treatment period, it's important that emollients are not applied on AD lesions because we want to evaluate the effect of the topical agent itself. So that's one thing for topical agents. Now for uh, the systemic, um, uh, for, the, for studies involving systemic agents, we can allow emollients to be used on the entire body, including AV lesions, because there is no application of a treatment on uh, lesions themselves. So uh, these are the differences and our recommendations in both cases. It's also important to note that emollients should not be applied before the study visits uh, because this can impact uh, the, the clinical evaluations by the investigator. So that answers the question. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, our next question is um, related to the uh, collection of skin biopsies. So in acne studies, uh, is there an impact of subject in, in, on the subject participation by including skin um, biopsies? Yes, so. uh, yeah, thank you, Audrey. Uh, so yeah, so, and acne is a bit special, right? Because acne, if you look at the severity or uh, is on the face, so we want to avoid to do biopsies on the face. But like in all, any other indication, uh, including biopsies in a study can be sometimes of a turnoff for subjects. So we want to limit the amount uh, or the size uh, of these, um, particularly in acne, what we have to be careful of, since we're not doing it in the face, we want to do it elsewhere. 
uh, we have to write a few lines in a protocol stating that if that what is that other area where the biopsy is going to be performed. Example on the back, shoulders, or neck. Want to avoid uh, sometimes even want to go more in the, uh, in the neck area because we have less risk of having keloids. Uh, and also, uh, we have to write a line if it's going to be treated area, right? Because if we're only treating the face, but we want to do a biopsy on the back and we see a change, change through time, then we also have to ensure that we're going to have the area where the biopsy is taken as treated. I spoke Thanks. fast because the time is short. <laughs> yes, so we still have time maybe for one or two more questions. So uh, our next question um, uh, would be uh, for Stephanie. So on AD, another question. So um, it was mentioned that HNRS should be evaluated uh, several days before baseline. Would it be possible to uh, please expand on this? Yeah, that's a very good point. I did mention that HNRS should be captured several days before baseline. And the reason for this is simply because itch is highly fluctuating from day to day in patients who suffer from, tender, from atopic dermatitis. So it's uh, important to evaluate itch several days uh, over a multiple days. So it provides a better estimate or an average value of itch intensity. So the baseline result is more reliable and robust. This can be done by collecting the HNRS score several days prior to the first study drug administration. It also presents the advantage that subjects get used to the evaluation and can then perform it during the study. So basically, we do collect uh, the HNRS scores several days prior to baseline simply to have a more uh, robust and reliable baseline value for itch intensity. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we have one more minute, so one last question uh, for Lucille now in, uh, in, in your portion in psoriasis. So you mentioned that sun exposure has an, imp an impact on psoriasis, but studies may be conducted to that site that are located in sunny areas or uh, the, the conduct can overlap during summer. Um, so how do you approach this in the protocol? Okay, so... Quickly, um, so just for a start, uh, for a study conducted in a uh, sunny area, uh, patients will still have psoriasis. So the idea is really to uh, keep in mind that we want something stable, stability is the key. So for those patients, we want them to continue with their regular habits. If they can avoid going too long under the sun, this would be great, of course, and they can wear protective apparel. And it's the same for summer. Productive apparel should be allowed. What is more important is for, you know, for example, uh, sites located in Montreal, Boston, where, you know, uh, the studies conduct uh, in, in winter and uh, those patients plan to move for a trip, uh, I don't know, let's say in Belize. Uh, th those patients uh, should not be included in the study because they will improve during their trip. And I believe this answers the question, I hope. Thanks, Lucille. <laughs> so I think we're, we're out of time. So I just wanted to end by uh, mentioning that uh, uh, the presentation will be made available for future consultations. So uh, keep, stay tuned. And if you have any further questions or inquiries for our team, uh, don't hesitate to contact our, our team at the address uh, provided here. So thank you everyone and I wish you a good day.